Welcome everyone. Our webinar is now live. I see you all flooding in. We have a max capacity of 100 attendees for this webinar. It's our first time doing this for our 10th anniversary. So I'm gonna wait until we reach that max capacity before I continue. I can see the participants number ticking up. Welcome to all of you joining us. I'm gonna give it a minute until we reach our max capacity of 100 attendees. If we exceed our max, we're gonna to stream to Facebook Live. Otherwise, we'll keep it just here. All right, great. I'm gonna get going and if more of you join in, that's just fine. So welcome to our 10th anniversary celebration. I'm gonna introduce a bit about us. The Psychophysiologic Disorders Association is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to end the chronic pain epidemic and opioid crisis by advancing the awareness, diagnosis and treatment of stress-induced medical conditions also known as PPD, that affects millions worldwide. What is PPD and how do you treat it? I'm gonna start off with a brief definition because I know that'll probably be the basis for a lot of our questions. Psychophysiologic disorders consists of pain and other symptoms not caused by organ disease or structural abnormalities. Instead, they are caused by neural circuits in the brain that activate the fight or flight response to create painful sensations that are very real. People with high levels of current and past stress are more likely to develop this, but it is through no fault of their own. Most people have experienced a psychophysiologic response when their face turns red with embarrassment or they feel a knot in their abdomen in a tense situation. When this normal reaction becomes strong enough, it can cause pain or other symptoms that can be as severe and as long lasting as any other form of illness. Treatment is usually successful and consists of education about how symptoms originate in the brain, reducing fear about the body being damaged and gradually increasing activity that has been avoided, increasing awareness of emotions linked to past or present stresses or traumas and improving communication skills with key people in their lives who are responsible for conflicts. I'm gonna introduce our panelists. We have Dr. David Clark. He's the president and co-founder of the PPDA board certified in gastroenterology and internal medicine, author of They Can't Find Anything Wrong, and co-author of Psychophysiologic Disorders, Trauma-Informed Interprofessional Diagnosis and Treatment. We also have Rob Munger. He's the VP and co-founder. He's the founder of the TMS Wiki, as well as thankyoudrsorno.org. He overcame several decades of chronic pain. We also have David Schechter, he specializes in family medicine and sports medicine. He's a successful patient of Dr. Sarno, later studying his work, which led to him being an author of Think Away Your Pain, The Mind-Body Workbook, and co-author of Psychophysiologic Disorders. And myself, Jessica Shahinian, I'm the executive director of the PPDA. I'm the creator of Got Pain Cure and other mind-body resources, and I've recovered from over 40 mind-body symptoms that nearly ended my dance career and also my life. So I'm very passionate about this work, and I'm happy to be hosting our first of many webinars to come. Brief disclaimer, this webinar is for informational purposes only. We do not offer medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. For questions concerning your health, you should consult with a doctor. Whenever anyone is looking for a diagnosis or treatment as to whether they have PPD and how to treat it, we always recommend you go through your doctor, rule out conditions with them first, and then you can learn more at ppdassociation.org. A lot of what we're gonna be talking about today in these 90 minutes, you can learn a lot more about on our website and the resources that we include there as well. I'm going to open up for questions I'm going to do my best to moderate for those of you who want to start getting your questions into the Q&A feature that is going to be at the bottom of your screen. I see some of you already doing it. Great. 
So there's a little Q and A button down there, get in your questions. For those of you who might not have a question yet, you're thinking what to ask, you can upvote each other's questions. If it's something you're interested in, just upvote it. If you definitely want an answer to that question and we're gonna do our best to pick. Again, stay away from questions that deal with individual uh, treatment questions just for yourself personally. Try to open it up to something more broad about the diagnosis or treatment of psychophysiologic disorders, the PPDA in our work, what's going on in mind-body medicine. We can answer all of that. I'll give you a minute to get some questions in. And we've also allowed those who emailed us prior, who aren't able to attend live, to also ask some good questions. Getting some good questions in. As I'm curating, I'll answer Hillary's. Were you able to continue dancing? Yes, I was able to continue dancing professionally. I chose to career transition into this work because long story short, I was more passionate about it. I had a full career in dance and this felt like a space where I could accomplish more. But yes, I was back to bending in half backwards, kicking my face. Me leaving dance had nothing to do with any limitations. All right, we're getting a few questions in. This is a good one. From Adder Shade, can you still have PPD if you have pain in the same location? Well, I can start with that one uh, and absolutely you can. Uh, it's certainly a, a hallmark of PPD that uh, symptoms will migrate from place to place, but um, they don't always do that. They'll oftentimes stay in one place like the low back or the cervical spine or one corner of the abdomen um, or the pelvis. Um, so it's really all about first looking for organ or structural abnormalities. And when you don't find those, uh, doing an evaluation for sources of stress that are capable of causing symptoms, treating those stresses and seeing if people improve. And that's what gives us the circumstantial evidence that we're on the right track uh, when we see people improve in response to treating their stresses. I can take the Great. SI joint dysfunction if you'd like. Great, take that. So SI joint, sacroiliac joint is a, is a joint in the low back uh, adjacent to the pelvis. And it's a common explanation for back pain. But in fact, much of that back pain is in fact a psychophysiologic disorder. And so if you haven't responded to treatment by practitioners who focus on the sacroiliac joint as the source of the pain, you may want to look more broadly at the problem as possibly a mind-body condition. We have another great question from Elizabeth. How does the treatment developed for PPD differ from CBT for chronic pain? Um, yeah, that is a good question uh, because there has been uh, in the last several years a number of published studies that have shown that <clears throat> new forms of psychotherapy are superior to CBT for alleviating PPD symptoms. And two of these, uh, three of them actually, uh, pain reprocessing therapy, and there's going to be a major uh, book published on that later this year, emotional awareness and expression therapy, and uh, uh, intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy. Those three forms of treatment have all been found to be better than CBT. And the characteristics of them that are different than CBT, the, the major focuses are uh, alleviating the fear that people have uh, about their symptoms, about their bodies being damaged. And the second major part is looking at uh, emotions that may have been repressed trying to help people connect with those, uh, recognize those, and then put them into words. And I would just add to that that cognitive behavioral therapy has traditionally focused on managing the symptoms rather than eliminating the symptoms. And when you look a little deeper, as Dr. Clark has just indicated, we find that in many cases you can eradicate the problem. 
Yeah, it's a major philosophical difference is <clears throat> that the new forms of treatment are attempting to uh, alleviate in, you know, the goal is complete uh, relief of symptoms, whereas CBT and uh, acceptance and commitment therapy are focused more on helping people cope. You know, I quite often involve partners or family members in treating PPD. Um, Sometimes they come to the office as part of the visit or they're present on the Zoom call if I'm doing a telehealth visit. And at other times I suggest that they watch one of the movies that is available on, on, on this subject. Uh, All the Rage of course was the first one. You can't always get a partner or spouse to read a book for you but you can often uh, stream a movie and get them to watch that and make them at least a little bit aware of it add some popcorn, it makes for a pleasant hour and a half uh, viewing and uh, some additional uh, information and insight. So I don't try to have the spouse be your doctor or your therapist, but just a little bit of uh, knowledge and support can be helpful. Um, I like uh, Ginny's question that I see on the screen here, ways to find out what your emotions are. And you know, there's, there are two techniques that are fairly simple to describe. One of them is to imagine yourself a butterfly on the wall uh, while you watch a child that you care about, either your own child or someone else's, um, living in the household that you grew up in and experiencing everything that you did as a child. And you're just a butterfly on the wall watching that happen. And how does that make you feel? And then write about some of those feelings or write a letter that you don't mail to the people who perpetrated um, adversity on you and as a kid. And that's often a great way to connect. Um, and Dr. Schubiner has a, uh, another way, which is um, to write, to think about these issues, to think about childhood stress, for example, and then write um, words, phrases, sentences, whatever comes to mind as quickly as you can on a piece of paper uh, without thinking about it too much. Just let um, ideas bubble up and uh, write them down as they pop up in your mind. And then after a minute or so, uh, you know, or two minutes, see what you've got on that page and begin to think about that. Uh, it's a way of tapping into the unconscious, uh, uh, that, that sort of fast automatic writing. So those are two good ways of uh, beginning the process of uh, emotional awareness. We got a great question from Michelle. I'll just jump in as to, can PPD include non-pain symptoms? She was mentioning some hypersensitivities and hyperacusis. I answered her by chat that yes, and you can learn more for all of you asking about that at ppdassociation.org slash symptoms. Uh, Dr. Clark, would you like to talk a bit about your context questionnaire for symptoms? Yeah, that's. Um, I think that is on that page that you just referenced. Um, it's There are two questionnaires there. The first is the context questionnaire. It has 30 questions and they're phrased in such a way that the more of them uh, that you answer yes to, the more likely it is uh, that you have PPD. I mean, we don't have a blood test or an imaging test that can definitively prove uh, that anybody has PPD, but um, to try to you know, move us in the direction of uh, an index of suspicion, we call it, um, of greater or lesser degree, the, the more of those questions that you answer yes to, um, the more likely PPD is responsible for your symptoms. And the second questionnaire that you can download is called the Hidden Stress Screening Questionnaire. It's only nine questions and it's got some explanatory information um, to help you understand the answers. Uh, but that one is looking for sources of stress that may not be uh, immediately obvious. Great. I want uh, Dr. Schechter to answer Jennifer's question. Can you still have PPD if you have a structural issue such as spondylolisthesis? And anytime you're talking about a radiologic diagnosis, so a diagnosis made by x-rays, it's possible that the diagnosis is uh, it's real, but it may not be the cause of the pain. And so there's been multiple studies done on a variety of different radiographic changes, x-ray findings, where things like spondylolisthesis and scoliosis and bulging discs do not uh, correlate 
specifically with pain because they're present very commonly in asymptomatic people, people without any symptoms. So the answer to the question would be yes, but you should certainly have a full evaluation by a, a physician to put that in perspective for you. Yeah, that's one of the challenging circumstances uh, when a person has an abnormality in the same location as their symptom, uh, and then you're trying to decide, well, is this abnormality responsible for the symptom uh, or is it not? And sometimes it can be hard to tell, but we have to be cautious when a um, abnormality on an x-ray is present in lots and lots of people who have no symptoms whatsoever. And for those people, especially before you do anything invasive, you know, like surgery or, or an injection, uh, to evaluate them uh, for a psychophysiologic cause. And, and if you uncover some issues there, especially if there's a chronological link between when and where the symptoms are happening and when and where uh, their stress issues were happening, then it makes sense to treat the stress and see if the person gets better before you, you jump into any invasive treatment. Here's a quick question from Gray Lee. He said, congratulations on your first 10th anniversary. In your experiences, what pain symptom or pain equivalent is cured most often using the PPD MBS treatment, mind-body syndrome treatment, and which is the most challenging typically? Yeah, that might be a good question for Rob. You've got uh, so many people that come to your uh, your wiki uh, looking for answers and uh, who put their stories um, on on your website. Do you have a sense for because uh, you you see a you know a broad range of uh, individuals there? Absolutely, yeah. There's a very very wide variety of symptoms. Um, yeah, so many different things can be PPD. The, some of the most common ones are, of course, the pain symptom uh, syndromes, uh, back pain, um, you know, up throughout the spine. Uh, one hears about those very often. The, the functional syndromes, um, very common as well. Um, but I, I've seen all sorts of people recover from this. Dr. Schechter, do you want to add something? One of the things we say in medicine is that if you're cured, it's 100% successful. And if you're not, it's 0%. So percentages in that sense don't matter because if you've if you've got an effect, if you if you use the treatment, it's effective. It's it worked for you, but I would say because there's been so much written historically about back pain, that seems to me to be one of the most common PPD symptoms that we see and one of the most effectively treated. Uh, sometimes some of the neurological kind of symptoms, nerve symptoms, can be more challenging, whether that be numbness, tingling, and other things. But again, every I've had success with almost every condition you can imagine at one point or another. And um, we'll be talking about that in an upcoming book that we might mention later as well. Dr. Clark and I and others are writing and editing that book. Yeah, I've noticed that people who are already taking opioids when I first see them uh, tend to take a longer time uh, to respond. Um, the success rates uh, with something called complex regional pain syndrome uh, seem to be less, not because the diagnosis is incorrect, but because those individuals are struggling with you know, very powerful levels of stress. Um, but the duration isn't as important as you might think it is uh, or would be. Uh, I've had patients who've been ill for decades with psychophysiologic disorders who've made excellent progress. Uh, I'll always remember one gentleman, 55 years uh, of symptoms, um, volume three of his paper chart, you know, because I saw him back in the days before we had electronic medical records. Volume three of his chart was eight centimeters thick. And yet, you know, a month after I saw him, his symptoms were gone. So the, the duration isn't as big a factor. It, it, it seems to be uh, correlated more that the difficulty or the, the ease of recovery is correlated more with the particular symptoms that people have. We have a question from Andy Bayless. Uh, what is your view on autoimmune disorders and the mind-body connection? Uh, it's a great question. There's a um, research study of adverse childhood experiences and their impact on autoimmune disorders. And they found a 
direct linear relationship between the, the more adverse childhood experiences you had, uh, it led to a greater um, risk of being hospitalized for an autoimmune disorder as an adult. And as we know, adverse childhood experiences are a, a strong influencing factor in the later development of PPD as well. The, the common factor seems to be the, the stress in childhood can activate the uh, body's immune system. Uh, so we don't know if um, using psychotherapy to alleviate the long-term impact of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, can affect the course of autoimmune disorders in the way that we do know it, it affects the course of PPD, um, but it's possible. Um, you know, it, uh, it'll be interesting to see if somebody does that study in the years to come to see if the um, the disease course of autoimmune disorders can be affected by a psychological treatment. Uh, at the moment, we don't know, but th there is that, that connection. I, I would add two things. Um, my clinical approach to that is do the conventional treatment that your doctor is recommending for most autoimmune disorders, but add to that some degree of the, of the psychophysiologic treatment. For example, there's literature on journaling, which is a technique that we use quite a bit, in this space, and that, that there are reduced inflammatory markers in rheumatoid arthritis, which is the classic kind of autoimmune disorder, uh, just from journaling. And also there's decreased inflammation in asthma. Now I'm not telling people not to take their asthma inhalers, I'm not telling people not to take their rheumatoid arthritis medicine, but if these interventions, whether it be psychotherapy or journaling or else uh, other uh, interventions can reduce your inflammation, Maybe you'll need less medication or maybe you'll go into remission. And if we don't know what did it, I'm fine with that as long as you're feeling better. We have a question from Linda. Can taking multiple drugs and searching for medical answers repeatedly actually make you worse? Yes. Um, when you say taking multiple medications, I presume this is something prescribed by your physician. And I'm of course wondering in general what condition it is. I, we can't answer specific questions, but there are times where patients get into a spiral of treatment where the first thing doesn't work. So instead of the doctor shifting gears <clears throat> or instead of the doctor maybe doesn't have the awareness of psychophysiological disorders, they add another treatment. And then they add another treatment, they add another layer of treatment. And before you know it, you're on quite a few things. And of course, then it can be side effects just from the treatments uh, beyond the disorder that you have. Yeah. And in addition, of course, you're, you're not working on the real cause of the problem. And so whatever that real cause is, it's not likely to get any better on its own if you're not working on it. Here's a great question from Sarah. Do you think that multiple childhood large T traumas or high ACE scores can result in a lengthier healing process? For example, some people have read Dr. Sarno's book and are automatically pain-free, kind of like me. Uh, others may take years. You know, there seem to be multiple reasons, some of which we can't clearly identify as to why some people respond more quickly than others. I certainly believe that those that have had multiple T traumas in childhood, in my experience, are more likely to need individual psychotherapy as part of their treatment rather than just an educational approach. But I've seen people respond rather quickly despite having a very traumatic childhood and background, and I've seen other people take longer. So you're, I talk about the healing journey, and everyone has a little bit of a different healing journey, and we just have to kind of accept that fact. There is a uh, paper that was published in 2019 that I just became aware of, but haven't read yet, <clears throat> that investigates um, uh, what they're calling PACEs or positive uh, childhood experiences as kind of a, a counterfactor to the adverse childhood experiences. Um, and those positive childhood experiences can contribute to a person's resilience. Uh, they contribute to a person being able to uh, successfully overcome the long-term impact of ACEs. Uh, and so in a particular individual, um, 
may have a better ability to um, overcome those early adversities um, because they had some positive experiences to go along with it. I, I noticed in my own practice that my patients who had someone in their life when they were young who believed in them, who supported them, who was positive towards them, that could go a long way toward uh, counteracting um, the adversity um, that they'd suffered elsewhere in their early lives. So that accounts at least for some of the, the variation that we see in people and their ability to recover. I should also add one other thing too, is in that what some people refer to as the big T trauma, which is like physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, uh, it was surprising to me early in my career to learn that um, milder forms of, of trauma could have the same long-term impact that someone who was always made to feel like a second rate human being, uh, that they, they were never, they were made to feel like they could never measure up to other people. Um, the bar they had to jump over to get um, praise from their parents, for example, always seemed to be just out of reach. You know, most of the time that wouldn't be classified as a, you know, a big T trauma, um, but it had the same long-term impact. Uh, and so I wouldn't discount if you feel like, oh, well, I didn't go through any of those really, really bad things. Uh, I just, you know, had trouble, you know, getting any kind of attention or support. That can be just as tough. We have a great question from Hillary that I've seen a lot of people ask, um, asking, is there evidence that food allergies and other um, sensitivities to things like pollen, dander, uh, is that PPD? Could that be PPD? And how does that tie into autoimmune disorders? Speaking of allergies, are, can allergies be PPD? Dr. Schechter? I was going to let you answer, Dr. Cork. <laughs> well, I can, so, I can talk about food allergies as a gastroenterologist. Uh, a lot of people who get symptoms uh, in their GI tract will um, quite naturally blame whatever it is they just ate. Um, but more often than not, it turns out that, you know, they're having an irritable bowel syndrome going on and the connection that they're making between those symptoms and the food that they just ate is, is not a real one. And they've, there's been a study where they gave people capsules that contained the foods that they thought they were allergic to, but if they couldn't tell whether they were getting that capsule with that food or a sugar pill, um, that it turned out they weren't reliably able to predict um, what they were going to react to. So a large fraction of people who think they have a food allergy <clears throat> actually don't. They have a, an irritable bowel type of uh, phenomenon going on. And that in turn is often linked uh, to PPD. I'll add a quick aside before going to the next question. I suffered from various allergies, uh, one of which aside from all the pollen dander, all that, I also had this strange reaction to dairy for at least seven years, it got progressively worse. First, it was, uh, I was born as a baby with an allergy, hives, rash, typical allergy symptoms. Then it developed to, um, it would cause uh, colon obstruction, intestinal bleeding, uh, thickening of my ileum wall that they thought was Crohn's, but later wasn't. It caused a lot of confusion. So there can be times where, um, Dr. Clark and I talked about this a lot in my case, if the brain perceives a danger signal, it can react uh, in the way to try to protect itself. Activating that immune response uh, can cause a chain effect of symptoms. So while there's a component that's PPD, intestinal bleeding is not, but it can create a domino effect. So when you relieve the stress component, the part that you can control, it can relieve the domino effect, which is what happened in my case. So I was able to relieve all my symptoms um, in that way. All right, we have some questions voted up at the top from Sol Sylvain. I've been guilty of shoving my feelings down in the past. I am now acknowledging them in a mindful way, but I have been having difficulty in finding a balance between being present with them and knowing when to let them go so they don't transform in a ruminating, a ruminating negative loop. Um, 
who wants to talk about that? I can take that one. The, uh, I, that is a very common issue. Uh, I, I find that mindfulness, or many people find that mindfulness really works well uh, as an approach, as an overarching approach. And as I read various books, I often see that classic ideas of mindfulness are really represented in there. What, what a lot of people find is that um, you want to acknowledge the emotion, uh, but in my experience at least, uh, it, it, it can help to have something else to focus on. You want to find something else in your life that brings you joy to allow you to focus on that now uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in an authentic manner. So that's what uh, a lot of the people on the TMS Wiki Forum have found helpful. A lot of my patients, uh, when they have those powerful emotions, uh, it's important to recognize where they're coming from, um, you know, what's triggering them. You know, a lot of my patients are, we keep going back to this because it's such a common phenomenon, but the roots of those negative emotions, you know, anger, fear, shame, grief, guilt uh, can be found in the person's uh, childhood experience. And if they can uh, recognize those emotions, write about them, write about the feelings they have about the people who um, perpetrated adversity against them, um, that can all help uh, a lot. Uh, in the more you put the feelings on a page or on a computer screen, the less they have to go into your bodies uh, to be expressed. Uh, I also encourage people to recognize that it's they've, they've done a remarkable thing to have survived this adversity as kids. Uh, and when they think about a child they care about growing up in, in the midst of those experiences, it can help them appreciate what they've done all the more. I mean, for many of my patients, it was as if they'd been born in the middle of a dangerous wilderness and somehow managed to find their way out. And that's, you know, that's a hero's journey and people should um, think of it in those terms. <clears throat> and when they do, uh, the emotions that they're having become um, a little easier to deal with. Thank you for adding that. Yeah, uh, very important as well. I'm gonna bring in Lisa's question that's voted at the top of the Q&A panel. What do you do with people that despite questioning of ACEs or trauma, they really don't think there is a cause, but as a provider, it seems that it is PPD and all the testing and ruling out has been done. That's part one of the question, take that first. So uh, I'm sorry, a patient that is not believing that their symptoms are psychophysiologic. They're still looking for a uh, physical cause. You, yeah, you're a clinician, Lisa, I, I, I presume. That's, is that what I'm reading, Jessica, that Lisa's a clinician? Yes, that's what I'm seeing. So to briefly interrupt Dr. Clark and then let him finish. No, um, no. But it, 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 sometimes one has to plant a seed and sometimes it takes a while for that seed to germinate and grow. And we do our best with patients who are resistant uh, or clients who are resistant to a PPD diagnosis to explain it to them and to listen to their concerns, listen to their doubts. And sometimes they have to just take a little bit of time. The good news is there's so many resources out there between books and podcasts and videos and our PPD Association website and so many other things that there's plenty of educational material for them to be exposed to. And this process of treatment, it very much depends upon the patient coming, meeting you halfway or being very actively involved in their treatment rather than passive. Uh, so we can't win them all, but usually if we start them along the road, eventually they'll, they'll come forward in my experience. You know, I, I'll follow up on what Dr. Schechter said. That was my story uh, that uh, as I, I had symptoms for 16 years um, and it was not the first time I had ever heard of this approach, uh, but, you know, I needed to take that time and, and come to the conclusion myself. So, and I, I tell people that, you know, it's, it's perfectly okay for us to keep thinking about a possible organ disease or structural abnormality that we can keep in mind that, um, something might evolve to the point of showing up on a diagnostic test in the future. Um, but in the meantime, while we're keeping that in mind, um, 
let's also do the work on uh, the PPD issues because that is a form of diagnostic test. It's a form of uh, uh, sort of an enlightened brain scan that we're doing by having people <clears throat> work on these issues to see if, if they make progress. Um, and you know, I'll also emphasize just how ill you can get from stress, from psychophysiologic issues. I mean, one of my patients, I was consulted uh, on her 70th day in the hospital. 17 year old girl getting 250 milligrams of morphine a day <clears throat> around the clock. Uh, and, you know, that was a, a dose that you'd often see in a late stage cancer patient, which she definitely didn't have. Um, so uh, just by emphasizing that these uh, phenomena are absolutely real and can be very severe, um, that can help people um, get a little more active in um, approaching the, uh, the psychosocial causes. Great. Part two of Lisa's question, I know we're excited to answer. Has there been a new chronic back pain study? Uh, she heard Alan Gordon mention it. Well, yes, there is. Um, <clears throat> and the PPDA has been involved in uh, supporting that work. And we are anticipating that it's going to be published um, in uh, later this year. And the results, I think, are going to be very exciting for everybody in this community. Great. A question from Chris. What's the chance of POTS, P-O-T-S, having psychological input? Dr. Clark, do you want to take um, it? I, I can start out um, that you know, I've had taken care of about a dozen people with POTS uh, over the course of my 30, um, whatever it is, 38 years now in this field. Um, although Dr. Schechter's beat me out, I think he's got 40 years now. Uh, actually, the, the group that you're looking at here, the four of us, we've got over a century, uh, if you add us all up, uh, of, of doing uh, this work or experiencing this phenomenon. But in, in those years, I saw about 12 patients, uh, and I would say 11 of them, um, it was clearly PPD and responded to the PPD approach. Um, the 12th of them, um, uh, there were some elements there, um, but I couldn't persuade myself or the patient, and she went off to uh, Mayo Clinic. Yeah, I've been to cardiology lectures where they acknowledge an emotional component in POTS. They just don't think it's the primary or exclusive way to treat it. A question from Paula. She's directing this to Dr. Clark. If TMS, which we refer to as PPD, mind-body, mimics a gastrointestinal disorder, something like IBS, would you treat it medically or only psychologically as mind-body? Yeah, it is a perfectly okay uh, to treat the symptoms if the symptoms are really uh, debilitating for somebody um, um, in parallel with uh, treating the psychological root causes. You know, if somebody is debilitated by diarrhea, for example, or abdominal pain, I mean, you can use an anti-diarrhea medication or an anti-spasmodic medication to try to alleviate the symptoms. And, you know, the same way that you'd use a crutch for somebody that's got a badly sprained ankle, uh, you're using it to help them with the, uh, the symptomatic relief uh, while you work on the, uh, the root causes and try to get the underlying condition to heal. The next question from Louise, whoop, it moved up. I'm going to direct to Dr. Schechter. If someone has had multiple spinal injuries and now believe their pain is due to scar tissue damage and nerve damage from the surgery, can they still recover using the PPD approach? Yeah, it's a good question, Louise. I've, I've treated a lot of people who are, who are post-surgical uh, with back comp continued back symptoms and had very good success post-surgically. I'd rather treat a virgin spine, so to speak, but if a person has had surgery already, I can work with them. The other thing is that the scar tissue diagnosis, you know, there's very few cases where radiologists and surgeons actually see scar tissue on an MRI that's so dramatic in the spinal canal that it might be playing a role. In general, this is kind of a 
throw it out there sort of wastebasket explanation. I wrote, recently wrote a brief essay on that, I believe on my Facebook page, but it's used as an excuse or a reason in a lot of cases by a lot of different practitioners with very little scientific support. So in, in most cases, persistent pain after spinal surgery, assuming there's not a clear structural cause that's seen, is PPD. Yeah, there was a, um, a study that was done um, of ACEs in relation to the outcome of spine surgery. And if I remember correctly, people who had three or more ACEs in their background, their spine surgery was only successful 15% of the time. Uh, and for people who had no ACEs, the spine surgery was successful well over half the time. So there was a, a hugely uh, strong relationship between ACEs and spine surgery outcomes. Dr. Schechter, I see you want to answer Lowell's question. Uh, just point me, point me in that direction. Whose question? Lowell oh. asks, after being more yeah. or less cured of chronic pain by Dr. Sarnos and others approach, is it necessary to continue doing any exercises? Or is it like being cured of an infection by an antibiotic and you need to do nothing further? All right, Lowell, I, I hope therefore that you're better uh, by that uh, question. But first of all, there's, I, I've dealt with a lot of people obviously who've gotten better and some people who've had flare ups again in the future. So let me just point out that human nature is such that when we stop feeling the symptom, we tend to want to get back to our lives and, and move away from the treatment. And I think that that's okay. I think that that's it just, that's just natural uh, for people to do it that way. So you don't have to continue any exercises. However, the skills that you learned in getting rid of your chronic pain are accessible to you the rest of your life. And if you do have a flare up, you know to check in on your emotional state. You can sit down and do journaling. You, you, have, you have books available or you have a therapist you can go back to or a physician. So in general, people just move on with their lives and that's what we want as uh, practitioners for them to do that, but they can come back if they need to. And it usually is much easier to deal with the second time around because you've had that successful experience. A lot of my patients, their symptoms might flare back up again because uh, someone that they, um, have emotional difficulty with has come back um, into their life in some way and they need to work on setting boundaries with that person. And so that's just something to remember that um, people that you've interacted with before who've caused distress for you, sometimes you just need um, stronger boundaries with that person. So that's a kind of a, an exercise that um, people have to sometimes do uh, repeatedly um, in the future. Here's a topical question from Sarah. Do you feel that COVID long haulers might now be dealing with PPD? That is a very topical question. <clears throat> it's something like 30% um, of people with COVID develop symptoms um, after the rest of the population with it has healed. Most of that 30% are better in a couple of weeks, but there's a, a sort of a 10% core where the symptoms uh, persist, um, brain fog and fatigue and exercise intolerance, a lot of symptoms that resemble uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And there's been pretty intensive uh, evaluation looking for what is going on with that population. And we don't have all the answers yet. Um, there, one study at Yale showed that there were more autoantibodies uh, in the circulation of people with this condition. So those are the proteins manufactured by the immune system that are attacking the body's tissues, uh, similar to those that are often found in autoimmune diseases. Um, so, it, you know, there could be a, you know, a biological phenomenon uh, that's happening there, but there could be elements of PPD as well. Uh, somebody who is living a very high energy on the treadmill all the time, highly focused uh, energetic lifestyle who is suddenly put down for two weeks by COVID and is 
you know, some part of their brain is, is discovering that, hey, there, it is possible to uh, take a break from that incredibly intensive lifestyle. And then they recover uh, from the COVID and the prospect of going back to that incredibly intensive lifestyle somehow looks different. And their body isn't quite ready to do that. Their mind isn't quite ready to do that. And it, it tries to um, pull them back from that lifestyle by Im- inflicting brain fog and fatigue. That's a, you know, a conceivable um, PPD related mechanism for what might be happening to at least some of those patients. Um, but right now we just don't have all the answers. Yeah, I would say we, we really don't have an answer at this point. There was one interesting study, a very small number of people who had the post-COVID uh, symptoms and then got the vaccination and reported improvement, yes. albeit temporary for a week or two. So you wonder if that's a placebo effect or if that's something to do with the antibodies going up. Uh, nobody really knows at this point. What I do try to tell my patients is don't get sucked into that rabbit hole of pardon the expression, chronic fatigue and all of that sort of stuff online, because the best attitude approach to take is I've got, I had a bad virus, my body's recovering from it, and every expectation is I will, I will, I will return to 100% normal health. That attitude is more likely to lead to your getting better than heading down any of the rabbit holes of uh, treatment at this point. I see that uh, some attendees are asking questions in the chat feature. It's a little harder for me to see it there and we can't upvote it that way. So definitely ask your questions in the Q&A panel, but because we have some good questions in the chat, I'll go to it, but no more questions in the chat, do it in the Q&A box. But I'm gonna give this to the group. Kathy's question, can trauma or PTSD be treated in a similar way that we treat PPD? And she's had EMDR experience. Um, if you have experience with trauma, you know, please describe. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not an expert on the treatment of post traumatic stress disorder. My principal role was to identify uh, the trauma in patients and then refer them to someone who is an expert uh, in treating it. Um, the one um, uh, challenge uh, that came about for um, other clinicians uh, and sometimes myself was when the trauma um, was remote from the onset of the person's symptoms. You know, it's pretty obvious if somebody has a trauma and the next day they start developing unexplained symptoms. But some of my patients, years went by between the trauma that they suffered and the onset of their uh, psychophysiologic illness. And in those cases, um, there was some kind of triggering event Uh, that did take place right before their symptoms began that was connected to the trauma uh, and was sufficient to uh, trigger their illness. Um, My favorite example of that is a a patient who witnessed uh, the shooting of her brother. Uh, He actually died from the gunshot wound. Um, It was the the bullet entered him in his body in the lower right corner of his abdomen. And then 10 years later, um, she happened to he was released the killer was released from prison and she didn't know it she ran into him in a store it came as a complete shock Uh, and very soon thereafter she started developing pain in the right lower corner of her abdomen so um, that was that you know she had a trauma remotely then a triggering event and then the symptoms but um, there are some overlaps in treating trauma but um, i'll leave that to the experts I'll add that there are helpful resources on our website and uh, curated from both the PPDA team and our colleagues. Uh, A couple of our board members, such as uh, Dr. Howard Schubiner, actually does view very close similarities between treating um, the symptoms experienced psychologically, such as anxiety, depression. He even has a book, Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression, which is treated very much in the same way as his approach on Unlearn Your Pain. Uh, Also, one of our other co-founders, Alan Gordon, is a therapist who runs the Pain Psychology Center, and they treat both PPD symptoms and uh, psychological symptoms in in a very similar way. Uh, So that's my little add-on to that. You can find more resources on our website on on those approaches. Always follow up with a licensed mental health professional to what extent you need 
uh, the PPD approach versus, you know, perhaps some other things that they might recommend. I'm going to bring in another question that came from our chat. Again, no more questions in chat. Do it in the Q&A. Uh, but this is a great one. Is there a particular time frame that you notice people recovering from chronic pain symptoms? Sounds like Farah is asking uh, any kind of typical timeline when it comes to chronic pain recovery using the PPD approach. I'm asked this a lot, and I think it's part of having the type T personality that we talk about, that people want to know, how long is this going to take me? I want to be as precise as possible. The problem with giving any kind of an answer is that then if you haven't achieved your goal by that point, you feel like you're a failure and you get harder on yourself, which is part of the problem with the condition in the first place. So I've gotten back to the concept of the healing journey, which is people take a different path and, and people walk at a different speed on that healing journey. And one just has to be open to the idea that healing can and will occur. When you see progress, that's obviously re, uh, reinforcing. And when you have setbacks, you know that that's part of the process as well, the ups and downs of, of healing, as I call it. So I really do prefer not to give an interval of time. Yeah, there's a lot of variability from person to person, and it's hard to predict. Um, my patients who came to me already taking opioids, they tended to take longer. Um, but apart from that, I mean, the, the nature of the symptoms, the number of the symptoms, uh, my personal record patient had 27 different symptoms, and all 27 were relieved in 30 days. Um, I've had, you know, I told about the patient earlier who had 55 years of um, symptoms that they went away in a month. Um, another patient, 79 years um, of symptoms. Um, after about a year and a half, she was 40% better, I would say, but, you know, she was in her late 80s. So I wasn't expecting a rapid turnaround. So it's, it's hard to predict. Building, building on what uh, Dr. Schechter was saying, uh, it's, it's very natural to want to know that. On the flip side, I think it's, it's potentially an, an opportunity to ask yourself, you know, why is this so important? Because uh, what he was saying about type T, I've, I've seen that very, very much as well. Um, it's, it, it can be another form of putting pressure on yourself. So just ask yourself that question. Here's a question for the group from Joan. We get this a lot which is why it's on our symptoms page. I know I keep mentioning it, it's a great page. Joan is wondering if fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue are PPD. They do respond to this approach. And we've seen that um, in lots and lots of patients. Um, their, Dr. Schubiner has done uh, some excellent studies, uh, particularly focused on fibromyalgia patients and has shown not only do they improve with emotional awareness and expression therapy, but they do so at a greater rate than uh, they do with cognitive behavioral therapy. Next question from Catherine. Can hypnotherapy or guided imagery help with bringing your deep seated emotions come to the surface to assist in healing? Hypnotherapists believe that. Um... You know, I don't work as, as much with hypnosis or hypnotherapists as I do with psychotherapists who also obviously have their ways of getting to some of the deeper issues. Uh, guided imagery I use more in the sense of uh, kind of an affirmative type of guided imagery to relax the nervous system and uh, help, help in healing rather than any type of uh, a looking backwards type of imagery. Uh, if Oh, sorry. Um, I, I thought he was done with that. Uh, David, why don't you take it after me? But uh, regarding fibromyalgia, let me just say that I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia with one of the people who uh, invented the diagnosis, came up with the, the points that are pressed and the three muses diagram. Um, and PPD was a help me. I, I should go back to the last question for a second. And chronic fatigue, um, it's possible that that some fraction of that population, there is a biological phenomenon going on. I mean, I'm still open to the possibility that uh, something may be discovered uh, of a biological nature uh, in that condition in, in at least some of the patients uh, that are suffering from it. You know, over the course of my career, I've seen, you know, a, a number of infectious organisms uh, discovered that we just, we didn't know about. Um, 
but when my career began 30, 40 years ago. So it's possible that something will be found that um, provides a biological explanation in, in chronic fatigue. As far as hypnotherapy, it's my experience has been that it's heavily dependent on the person who's doing the hypnotherapy. Some of them are quite effective in helping people with PPD and others not so much. So it, it's hard to predict there. Um, but if uh, you're a practitioner and you can find a hypnotherapist uh, to work with that achieves good results with PPD patients, um, stick with them or her. Getting a lot of really good questions and a lot of upvoting going on. I saw one and I'm just trying to find it. While you're looking for it, somebody had a question in the chat earlier about where they can find some of these research papers. And if they look at ppdassociation.org slash bibliography with a lowercase b, um, they will find it. It's, it's awesome. I just uh, sent that link. Yes, uh, we update an annotated and indexed bibliography uh, centered on psychophysiologic disorders and chronic pain. It's a really valuable resource. It's great for convincing those that are skeptical or at least providing it so they can decide if they want to be convinced. And again, yeah, you can find that on, on our website slash bibliography. Each paper has a brief paragraph describing the key findings. Um, and if you really wanna get through it fast, you just read the yellow highlights and you can probably read 200 papers in 20 minutes. As I'm picking out another question, Dr. Clark, do you want to talk briefly about the bibliography and how the PPDA has developed its approach? Is our approach based on decades of research? Like, how did we come to this approach? All the panelists are welcome to chime in for this as I pick another question. Um, you know, it's, it's a remarkable thing. Um, when I think back to... Um, the conference that brought us all together in Ann Arbor in 2009 and every speaker got 20 or 30 minutes to uh, present their experience uh, with PPD and we had people from all over the country who would never met each other before there were 40 or 50 people in the room and just by listening to people um, carefully and empathetically and doing trial and error to try to understand what worked best and discarding what didn't and keeping and developing what did. We had all kind of come to very similar conclusions um, about all this. Uh, you know, many people in the room were mentored by Dr. Sarno, but there were many who were not, who had just worked uh, uh, on these issues <clears throat> via their patients. And uh, that's how I came to it. Uh, and it's just remarkable how, you know, the same underlying truths uh, drew us all um, to the same very similar place. Um, even coming from these, this, you know, very wide range of backgrounds. We had orthopedists, we had internists, we had gastroenterologists, we had people who were, you know, not professional uh, uh, in the health field. Um, and who had all just, again, reached these same conclusions about um, reducing the fear and anxiety uh, around the symptoms, um, digging into uncovering uh, repressed emotions, putting those emotions into words in various ways, uh, and the remarkable outcomes uh, that we were seeing with those relatively simple ideas. We have a question from Patrick. I'm going to summarize uh, what I believe Patrick is asking here. Uh, he's encountered various uh, PPD mind-body resources from popular books such as uh, Gabor Mate, um, Dr. Sarno's work, uh, you know, things geared towards PPD versus TMS, you know, those different ways of talking about it. He says, even though the pain is usually extremely unpleasant, it is usually described as non-destructive, benign, on a physical level. Our Sarno, PPD Association, et cetera, and Gabor Mate all talking about the same thing. I believe this brings into question is how does our approach compare and contrast with the approach of others within the mind-body field, particularly the, the more well-known ones? I, I can speak to my 
sense of, of these conditions that we treat, which is that when the patient is successfully treated, they return to normal. And so therefore there was no damage to the structure. There was no, uh, there was a functional change during the period of symptoms, but there was not a structural uh, pathology or damage. Now, Gabor Mate has written a number of books and I haven't read all of them. And I think he dealt with a lot of cancer patients and other things as well. And so there's different disorders that you could be talking about that might have a psychophysiologic component. But in terms of what Dr. Clark and I have discussed today, PPDs, um, I, I think that there is, they're, they're not sinister. Uh, they're quite uncomfortable, painful, or discomforting, in, depending on the symptom, but they are functional disorders rather than uh, organ pathology. Yeah, that's, that's what these conditions have in common is that the symptoms are not generated by an organ disease or a structural abnormality. They're generated by the changes in the neuroanatomy of the brain. And the, the functional magnetic resonance imaging studies um, have shown us this, that people who are healthy don't have these neuroanatomic changes in their brains. And people with fibromyalgia and other forms of PPD have been shown um, to have these changes. So it's, that's why we call it a psychophysiologic disorder. It's a blend of psychology and physiology, and the physiology is, uh, is in the brain. Great. I'm gonna to go to Linda's question as it's been upvoted to the top. Can you discuss the symptom imperative? She's experienced pain that moves, changes intensity, switches from one leg to the other, and it's very indistinct, uh, very exhausting. What is your recommendation on how to address this? Linda had two questions on the symptom imperative, and the, the 2 11 p.m. one is the first one that I saw. Uh, she describes pain moving and fluctuating within a 10 minute time span that confusing, becomes intense, it's difficult to maintain a detached demeanor, and a spiral of attention and fear can start. So. If you're having symptoms that are moving around, that is not a structural or organ pathology disease process when, when they're shifting and moving and fluctuating constantly like that. So that can actually be reinforcing of this message that the problem is benign and that the problem originates in the, in the mind, brain, and emotions. And so use that to your advantage. You've got it uh, on the run, so to speak, it's moving. And moving is good, it's progress. It's not the same as going away, which is what we want, but don't look at it as something to be afraid of. It's certainly confusing, but look at it as something that the doctors here and the doctors with experience in this field would consider actually reinforcing of the diagnosis. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the term symptom imperative because it implies that, um it's imperative that the symptoms are gonna keep coming back on people. And that's not at all the case. Um, that whenever you have symptoms, it's an indication that there's an emotion, a stress um, that's going on in your life uh, that needs to be addressed. It's your body trying to tell you that there are there is something uh, going on emotionally um, or stress-wise or trauma-wise um, that uh, needs attention paid to it. And you know, as I've alluded to, with for a lot of people, the roots of that can be in the childhood experience. Although, if there's someone in your life at the moment who was adversely active when you were a child, you know, that can certainly be a trigger for it as well. But it's it's a signal. Um, but it um, when it's dealt with successfully, it doesn't have to be an imperative anymore. It can be made uh, to go away. Yeah, I like the term symptom substitution or symptom migration to there refer to the process rather than imperative, which sounds like you have to have it. Um, it can Symptoms can migrate in PPD, and that's not a bad thing. That's often the step before going away. And it's very reassuring when they migrate because, you know, tumors and infections and inflammation um, and fractures, you know, they're not going to migrate. Exactly. You know, you can use that to help you accept the diagnosis and, and help give yourself confidence that there is hope and that you can make progress. 
Uh, Dr. Schechter, I see you want to answer Catherine's question. She's looking for tips to deal with conditioning, such as waking up with a headache. Okay, so it's not uncommon for people to have a pattern to their PPD symptoms. Sometimes people are worse at night. Sometimes people are worse in the morning. Sometimes people are worse at three o'clock. And the fact that people have these different patterns, I think uh, also supports the, the diagnosis of PPD. But in terms of someone who's used to a particular pattern, you're looking for anything you can do in addition to the ordinary PPD work to try to uncover the emotional triggers and to educate yourself about it. You're looking for anything you can do to break the cycle. So some patients find that they can talk to themselves and say, okay, tonight I'm not gonna get the headache. And, and that simple self-talk can sometimes break it, break the pattern. Or sometimes people will go to sleep a little bit earlier or a little bit later just to try to get out of that static situation they're in when they're in a conditioned pattern. But understanding it, of course, makes it less threatening, makes it less concerning, and gives it a more benign uh, flavor. Yeah, what he's describing is really part of the day-to-day -day work of overcoming uh, PPD, where you know it's something that, that a lot of you will do at home, you know, on your own. Uh, and there's there's so many different approaches. I think it's it's really helpful to take a uh, a larger and more complex toolbox where you can try different things and different approaches and and be uh, resilient and flexible uh, in their application. Um, I mentioned earlier one thing which really works for me because when you when you have these symptoms, often it's it's something which goes on. They may repeat, and it's okay. It's just totally fine because you know that that you're in control and that you have the tools. But one thing which I find really really helpful is, um, you know. Uh, finding something else that I enjoy that can kind of draw me back into life. It's, it's almost like the symptoms are there to take me out of, uh, to, to, to get me into a fear cycle as opposed to being present in my life. And if I can find some, some element of joy, something that really draws me in, then sometimes I, I, I come back and I notice, oh, the symptoms are gone. You know, I, I come back from being immersed in this other task and the symptoms are gone. Yeah, that's a really important uh, therapeutic idea. So many of my patients grew up in circumstances where as children, they had to focus on the needs of those around them uh, at, to a level that you know, was well beyond their capabilities uh, at that age. And what happens in those circumstances is the child doesn't sufficiently learn how to play. And if you don't learn how to play, then you're not learning self-care skills. And as a, an adult, you may become the kind of person that takes care of everybody else in your world, but you have difficulty putting yourself on the list of people you take care of. And so it, it's, it's essential to take some, a block of time out every week uh, for activity that has no purpose but your own joy. And when you learn how to do that, and it's an essential human skill, you'll have that skill for the rest of your life. And anytime your stress level is, is starting to take off, you can say, wait a minute, I now have this thing I can do that's, uh, that's purely fun for me, going to bring the stress level back down. Great. Our next question comes from Mary. If the pain is migraining, such as someone who presents with migraine attacks, then later abdominal pain, then severe itching or rashes, uh, can it all be correlated to the same stressors or be related to ACEs? How can you explain this to the patient in a way that they feel heard? Well, it's extremely important that the patient feels heard and acknowledging the reality of their symptoms is the first thing. These are real symptoms. It's not imaginary. It's actually experienced, uh, but it's benign. It's not serious. It's not dangerous to the body. Um, as far as the connection to the stressors, the question disappeared. As far as the, the, the connection to the stressors, um, you know, you, you, you do the, 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 the typical work in that regard, whether it be the therapy, I think uh, Mary's probably a therapist, or the journaling or other techniques that we use to try to connect to the emotional uh, origins of the problem. Yeah, one of the great things about symptoms that are as variable as the ones that Mary just described is that there's really only one place those symptoms can be coming from, and that's the brain. And that there are neuroanatomic changes uh, in that person's brain. And those in turn are coming from ACEs or stress or trauma uh, or repressed emotions. And you can explain the to the patient that um, 
these issues are fully capable of causing real live symptoms that are all over your body like that. And that if we can identify the stress, repressed emotions or trauma, we can make progress. That would seem to tie into Dr. Jalal's question who asks, he, ha he or she has difficulty in, uh, introducing the term psychophysiologic disorder to the patients, feels like the patients feel like they're being called a psycho. And so, you know, the, the language and the communication is, is one of the challenges in this area. And it's something that we obviously have to get good at. It may have been something that Rob struggled with initially when he first heard about the diagnosis. Maybe no, not so much. Okay. So you're explaining to patients very calmly that these are real symptoms, real conditions. You're not saying that they're making them up or anything of that sort. It's just that the human brain and the human nervous system is the most complicated structure we know of in the universe at this point. And so a complicated structure like that has a lot of things going on underneath the surface. And we've only scratched the surface of understanding it. So as you start explaining this to patients with a combination of physiology and psychology and a very non-judgmental uh, fashion, usually you can find some way that works for that patient and for you in your practice to explain to people about psychophysiologic disorders. You don't have to immediately jump to that term if you don't want to. Some, you can you can call it you can call it stress related illness uh, or mind body condition, but you know, or you can just say that you know psychology can affect physiology, and anybody who's ever blushed with embarrassment knows that. Anybody who's ever felt a knot in their abdomen when they're in a tense situation knows that psychology can affect physiology. And if you have a computer science person, I like to say to them that language is the software of the brain, and so we're going to be talking about language here and the narrative of your life. Uh, in order to affect the hardware of your brain as well and your nervous system. So you find different ways of experience, of explaining it to different people. Yeah, Dr. Clark used the term uh, stress-related illness. And I think, I think that's a, a good one. There's a lot of flexibility. It reminded me of a question that came up earlier, earlier where someone wanted to reach out to their, um, their physician in the VA system and how to do that. You know, a, a, an obvious first step is there is that practitioner section of the PPD. Uh, PPDA's website, ppdassociation.org slash practitioners. You can go there, um, just click on the practitioner link. A lot, many great resources there. In terms of books, sometimes people will pass out books. I find that for a physician, especially for someone who doesn't know anything about it, it's their first exposure. I think Dr. Clark's book is excellent. Um, it, it uses that terminology of stress illness. Um, so it's, and it's, I find it's, it's something that is, is uh, going to be very, um, non-threatening or uh, comfortable for uh, a generalist physician. Dr. Schechter, I see you want to answer Teresa's question. Uh, she's a manual therapist with 26 years of experience as well as healing herself from several TMS symptoms, yay. Uh, she asks for your thoughts on vagus nerve dynamics in this process. The vagus nerve is the, is the longest nerve in the body, and it uh, basically empowers the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the calming nervous system in contrast to the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight, flight, and, fr and flee uh, nervous system. So I think that we're activating the vagus nervous system when we breathe slowly. We activate it when we play, like Dr. Clark was referring to, find time for play in your life. We activate it when we meditate. We activate it when we do something we enjoy. And we activate it when we begin to calm ourselves from fear about uh, PPD symptoms. So I think that the vagus nerve is probably part of all of this physiology. We'll understand more of this in the future, but um, that's, that's how I connect it. Yeah, I can just mention there's a concept out there called polyvagal theory. And what I've seen is that it's can be a nice metaphor, but there hasn't been any independent scientific confirmation from it um, in the 25 years that it's been out there. In terms of what Dr. Schechter was saying, uh, one metaphor which sometimes works well among patients uh, when they're discussing in communities is the rage soothe ratio. And that's, that's related to that uh, notion of play as well is that it's, it's the ratio between how much you are uh, increasing your, your, your stress, increasing um, that pressure that you're putting on yourself uh, and how much you're soothing yourself. And yeah, the Vegas. 
as I'll, I'll let him describe how, uh, but the uh, Dr. Schechter described how uh, the vagus nerve is, is relevant for that. I'm going to let Dr. Clark address uh, Nate's question in particular, because I can empathize with you, Nate. Uh, he has IBS, which he's convinced is PPD. Uh, as part of this, he often feels the urgency to visit the toilet about half the time it's productive, about other half the time it's a false alarm. The solution here feels more complicated than for back pain. How can I tell my system to ignore the symptom given that we all really need to visit the toilet sometimes? Before uh, Dr. Clark jumps in, um, I'm gonna add, tag on to it by saying that um, I, from my personal experience and, and what I do hear a lot from those who contact us at the PPDA, there is that challenge. A lot of the terminology that our colleagues use is to ignore the pain or ignore the symptom. Not everyone refers to that in the treatment approach and it, it can be harder to ignore certain things than others. Can you talk on that? Yeah, the um, there are some differences in um, how to approach um, say pain in a fixed location like the low back uh, versus a gastrointestinal symptom. And um, you know, I tend not to use uh, as much of the um, uh, somatic tracking kind of technique or the fear reduction technique uh, when it comes to gastrointestinal symptoms. Well, what people are experiencing there um, in the GI tract is oftentimes uh, the sympathetic nervous system sending signals that are causing the bowels to contract sometimes uh, with a lot of force. And that force can be propulsive in some people and non-propulsive uh, in other people. Um, but either way, what you want to do is reduce the intensity of that signal. And that comes from identifying uh, the source of uh, stress, trauma, or repressed emotions and working to um, alleviate those. So it's, it's a little bit different approach with the gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, but um, the outcomes are, are just as good. Great. Um, a good question from Hillary. The question of structural changes not being the source of pain is confusing when applied to normal aging, changes that are trackable by radiological studies, x-rays, MRIs, which doctors call arthritis, but it's wear and tear seen in the joints, not rheumatoid. Can you address this? I know this person, so I'm going to allow Dr. Clark to answer. Okay. Um, if he wishes. If he doesn't wish, I'll answer. Yeah, it... Um, um, it's it's a, an area that we um, encounter uh, regularly where there are changes that we can see um, on an x-ray that... Uh, um, might or might not be capable of producing symptoms. And oftentimes the level of change that we see on an X-ray falls into the category of normal aging. Um, you know, famous study uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in the mid 1990s of a hundred or so people <clears throat> having MRIs of their spine um, who had no symptoms. Just They just took a hundred people who felt perfectly fine and MRI'd them and found uh, enormous proportions of them had abnormalities uh, of their discs and their vertebrae, um, but they weren't causing any symptoms. Uh, another study of um, <clears throat> women undergoing laparoscopy of their, their pelvis, um, and a third of the women had abnormalities, um, adhesions, cysts, um, endometriosis, where the lining of the uterus has leaked out and started growing in the pelvis. Um, but a third of the women in a group that was uh, free of any symptoms also had those same abnormalities. So it can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, in my own field, people with gallstones, with pain in the general area of those gallstones. Were, were the gallstones doing it or was it a, a PPD problem? So it, it can be a challenge to figure it out. <clears throat> so what I would often do is assess the person for stress, trauma, and repressed emotions and see how much they were dealing with. And if they were dealing with a lot and there wasn't any 
urgency about invasive treatment of the abnormality, um, <clears throat> then we would treat the um, underlying psychosocial stresses and see if the person improved. And if they did, that was um, in effect a diagnostic test that was telling us what the real cause of the symptoms was. So that's kind of the general philosophical approach to this. So if you're not sure <clears throat> which one it is, and there's no signs or symptoms that indicate, you know, you need urgent invasive treatment, or you're going to have permanent nerve damage, uh, then you can hold off on the urgent invasive treatment, work on the PPD issues, and see what level of improvement you get. Um, our colleague, Dr. Hanscom, um, started doing psychological treatment of his um, spine pain patients uh, in hopes he would get better surgical outcomes. And to his surprise, a lot of his patients didn't need the surgery anymore after they got the PPD treatment. Just let me add on the subject of aging changes in the spine. Aging changes in the spine, by definition, become more and more notable as you get older. A person in their 90s would have more aging changes typically than a person in their 70s. But what Dr. Sarno noted decades ago was that back pain, disabling back pain was actually more common in people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s when if you went by the aging changes, it would be more common in your 70s, 80s, and 90s, which is not to say that a, an 80 or a 90 year old doesn't have an ache in his back from time to time, but we're talking about, again, disabling back pain that kind of you know, ruins your life, more common in a younger age group. So that would really go against the idea that these aging changes are significant causes of chronic pain. Dr. Schechter, I see you wanted to answer Gray's question. He asks you specifically, what was Dr. John Sarno like? Can you tell us about him? Well, if you, maybe you should look at the movie as well, All the Rage, where he's, uh, he's featured in an interview toward the end of his life. But, you know, I knew him from his, oh, there you go. <laughs> look, <laughs> this is uh, featured at the end of the, of the thing. It's the only other copy in the world. Um, I, I knew him when he was obviously quite a bit younger through the end of his life. And um, he was a small man in stature, but very confident in manner. And uh, the classic uh, contrast is Howard Stern, who mentions him in, in a couple of his books, a very tall man in stature, casually dressed. Dr. Sarno would wear a bow tie quite often and, and a white, white coat or a suit. And he was a confident uh, person who could really project his belief and stay powerful about his belief in, in the cause of, of back pain and chronic pain, despite being surrounded by 700 physicians at NYU Medical Center who didn't really agree with him. And so it takes a certain personality to be able to do that. Um, on the other hand, if you disagreed with Dr. Sarno, even though you were a, you know, a proponent of his, of his work as I was, if you disagreed, you often ran into a little bit of a conflict because sometimes people with very strong opinions like that um, aren't really looking to debate or modify their opinions. They're just looking to for someone to agree, agree with them. And I'm not saying this in a derogatory manner, just, uh, just a noting fact. Um, but he is certainly a, a pioneer in the field, a visionary, and a person who helped tens of thousands of people get better in his office, and probably hundreds of thousands, if not more, through his books. And has been one of the inspirations for this movement. Uh, although Dr. S Dr. Clark, you know, kind of developed it on his own uh, approach. Uh, many of the people who practice in this area had some type of direct exposure to Dr. Sarno, either in my case as a student spending a whole summer with him and uh, doing research and being treated as a patient as well, or in, in the case of people who spent a few days with him or psychotherapists who attended some of his uh, lectures or seminars, or people whose spouses were helped by his book and then decided to do that work in their own clinical work, which I've seen a number of cases as well. So an inspirational figure and uh, a, a giant of, of medicine in the 20th century primarily, and um, someone who had a huge uh, impact upon my life and my career and, um, and, and, and this movement. 
Great. We're wrapping up the webinar pretty soon. We are going to do two more questions and then a quick closing statement. So from Louise, do we know why do we know why in some people their overwhelm or stress manifests as pain and in others it comes out as OCD or panic attacks? How does the mind body decide? Boy, that is such a great question. I really wish I knew the answer to that one. Um, um, you know, even though I treated over 7,000 people, um, you would need probably an even more broad experience um, to be able to link what it was people went through um, for their ACE experience and their you know, counteracting resilience experience. Um, and then to try to link that up with um, the particular symptoms that uh, they developed later. Um, it's, I don't think there's an answer to that question with the available research. Um, David, are you familiar? Yeah, I, would, with I would say that no one knows. I mean, Alan Abbas has written some papers where he talks about the different type of symptom manifesting as a visceral versus a, a sensory versus a different, you know, based on the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of trauma, the kind of experience. Obviously, Louise Hayes, who is not a scientific writer, uh, wrote a, a book trying to describe how your different emotions would affect different parts of the body and things. And it's a non-scientific uh, book. So I don't think anyone knows. And um, we just have to accept the fact that we're complicated individuals. We have different genetic backgrounds. We have different childhood experiences. We have different aces and different paces, as Dr. Clark said positive early childhood experiences. And so that's just the way it shakes out at this point. Maybe a hundred years from now, somebody will figure that out. Yeah, I remember one of my patients suffered a uh, physical trauma to her tailbone uh, at the age of four, and then 50 years later developed stress-related pain in the same location. So I mean, I, we can speculate that a, a nerve pathway was established at the age of four that was then um, recruited uh, as a way to manifest uh, psychophysiologic pain uh, 50 years later, but you don't see those kinds of correlations very often. Often it's the thing which catches your attention. Sometimes it's the thing that scares you the most that flares up. Mm -hmm. All right, we have time for our last question and then I'll give you some more info before we go. So Patrick asks, uh, is the U.S. ready for widespread acceptance of PPD diagnosis and treatment? Or would that public perception be a roadblock? Do people like this diagnosis and treatment plan or are too many people wanting quick fixes instead? You know, I, I think we're very close to a tipping point. Um, I tend to be um, excessively optimistic about these things, but you know, after 35 plus years of doing this work, I've never seen uh, so much interest in it. I think part, part of that is driven by the disaster of the uh, opioid overuse epidemic. That was the quick fix was to give everybody opioids. And the result has been, a, you know, unmitigated disaster and people are desperate to find a a scientifically valid alternative approach. And we're seeing more and more interest in this. Um, and a lot of scientific research now that um, backs up this approach. So yeah, I, I think um, we've been an organization now incorporated for 10 years. I think uh, 10 years from today, um, we're gonna be um, in a much better place. Um, well said, Dr. Clark. Good, good, final, good final comments, Dr. Clark. To tag on to that, I want to share a bit with those of you still hanging on as to what we are up to to advance that acceptance. On our website, you can learn a lot more about us, but some of the projects that we have in the works is uh, the Boulder clinical study that was mentioned before. This is a groundbreaking chronic pain study that we're very much looking forward to being published uh, very soon. That'll really help advance the acceptance on this. Uh, one of our board members is collaborating with United Health Group, the world's largest healthcare company, on a PPD approach to treat chronic pain. So there's already a model pain clinic, and it's really great, exciting news that United Health Group is taking a look at this. If they like what they find, 
it's going to spread to other health insurers. It means more patients are gonna get this covered by their insurance. The treatment approach would change that would benefit patients, it would benefit practitioners, it would lower healthcare costs. It's what we call the quadruple aim. We have a chronic pain documentary that we're supporting that's coming out soon. It's called Pain Brain. Uh, it should release either later this year or early next year, depending on which distributors we can find. Now this documentary is uh, featured the clinical trial that we did in Boulder, and it just shows how fascinating the work is and, and how effective it is in a really compelling way of following the journeys of some chronic pain patients. We have an online course that was designed for health professionals led by Dr. Clark and myself. It's while it's designed for healthcare professionals, it's really useful for patients because education is a key component in recovery. We already have one textbook out uh, that two of our panelists are co-authors of. It's a great book. You can find it on Amazon. All proceeds support our work. And we have a second PPD textbook coming out soon. Uh, we hope to publish that as quickly as we can compile it and it will complement our, our previous book that's out. And uh, we also are putting together a virtual conference. It's gonna be our first virtual conference. It'll be this fall. We're still working on setting the date. We're gonna have various speakers. So far, it looks like we're hovering at least around 20-ish speakers are gonna be there. And they're all experts in the field of mind-body medicine from practitioners to patients, different specialties. We're gonna send out information about that soon. It'll also be on our website. If you don't already subscribe to our email list, please do. If you don't yet follow us on Facebook, I, we're streaming live on Facebook, please do. And you're gonna be able to know more about the resources that we will be sharing soon. Lastly, I do want to point out that if you haven't used our website or used it thoroughly yet, if you're a patient, go through all of the pages on the patients tab. It's really gonna be helpful for you, practitioners, all these pages are directed to you, which also includes that bibliography of research. There's also a practitioner directory, and that directory is a great way to find help. Not everyone recovers from just the recovery resources on their own. Many are going to need to work with a licensed medical or mental health practitioner. And as a nonprofit celebrating 10 years, we're special in the sense that you can actually get involved. We are a growing team. You can go under here and click to volunteer. And if you have any questions as well, feel free to follow up emailing us, info at ppdassociation.org. We're gonna be doing more of these webinars, hopefully consistently. It's great to know who's actually interested in attending. This is our first time having an audience. So the more demand, the more webinars we will have. Thank you so much for taking the time today to celebrate our 10 year anniversary. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists wonderful members that are leading the forefront of the PPD Association and our work. Thank you so much, everyone. This recording will be available on demand. It'll be emailed to you automatically if you registered. And again, any questions, just follow up with me. Thanks, everyone.